Dr. Clarence Bass, Professor Emeritus at Bethel Theological Seminary. Well, early in his ministry, he preached in a church in Los Angeles. And he thought he'd done a pretty good job on the sermon. And as he went to the door in the back, greeting people as they were leaving the sanctuary, the remarks to him about his preaching were complimentary. That is, until a little old man came up to him and said, you preached way too long, and it was rather boring. Well, Dr. Bass wasn't phased by the remark, especially in light of the many positive comments. Later, however, that same morning, that same man found the preacher again, and he said to him, I didn't understand a single word you said. It was totally incomprehensible. Dr. Bass thought it strange that this man had tried to find him a second time to complain. But then the same man went to the preacher a third time. And again, with more negativity, he exclaimed, you are one of the worst preachers that have ever visited this church. You are one of the worst preachers that ever visited this church. Well, this called for some explanation. So Dr. Bass sought out one of the leaders of that church who was standing nearby, and he asked him, do you see that little man over there? Uh, who is he? Well, the leader said, don't pay any attention to him. All he does is go around the place repeating what he hears everybody else say. <laughs> Not any consolation there. As people living in this world, there's no escaping it. We do care what others say about us. But nothing would beat hearing positive words spoken to us from the lips of Jesus. And the thing about what Jesus says is that he doesn't simply repeat what he hears everybody else say. As a matter of fact, when we stand before the Lord someday, it won't really matter what others said about us, good or bad. It will only matter what Jesus says about us. It's been said that the difference between reputation and character is that reputation is what others say about you on your tombstone, and character is what angels say about you before the throne of God. John Wooden put it this way. He said, character is what you really are, while your reputation is merely what others think you are. Well, with that, turn with me to the book of Revelation, if you're not there already, to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, and we find here in chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation that there are seven letters to seven churches. These hand-picked churches all got mail. And when they opened up their mail, they discovered they were words from the lips of Jesus. Now, some believe that these seven churches represent seven ages of the church until the return of Christ. That in other words, we're in the seventh period of time, the church of Laodicea, and that each of these just represent a period of time throughout church history. And I, I don't go along with that. I believe that these letters are written to real people in real situations. These are real seven churches. So Jesus has some words for these churches and he isn't going to say what others say, but what he really knows. What are we known for? What would Jesus say to us? Well, we're looking at the second letter this morning. We're going to be picking it up in verse 8. It's written to the church in Smyrna. And you'll notice as we go through this, Jesus has no negative words for the church in Smyrna. In this case, there's only a commendation for this church. There's no rebuke. That need not be nice. Well, follow along with me, Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse 8. Revelation 2, verse 8, it says, To the angel, or better understood, I believe, messenger or leader, to the messenger of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. As is common in each of the letters, it begins with a description of Christ. Description of Christ. It's going to be our first heading for this morning. Description of Christ. And there are a couple of designations that we see here that we saw earlier when we were looking at chapter 1. The first uh, description, designation, he says he is the first and the last. Now, this is a title exclusively for Yahweh God in the Old Testament. You'll find that in Isaiah 44, uh, verse 6, and Isaiah 48, Verse 12, uh, but here 
the self-description is Jesus' claim to be the Lord God Almighty, the creator of all things, like the verses I read at the beginning of worship this morning from John 1. It says here, he is the first. He existed long before there ever was a church in Smyrna, and he is the last meaning he will outlive all churches. He will outlive all world powers and emperors and rulers and, and even outlive all entire world systems. And as the first and the last, Jesus will have the final word. Being the first and the last, it means his plans go far beyond any moment in time. If he's the first and the last, it means that he's not going anywhere. He has always been and always will be with every church down through the ages. So he speaks of himself as the first and the last. He also speaks of him as, himself as the one who has died and came to life again. One who has died and came to life again. The fact that Jesus died is significant really on several fronts. One being that he died means that the almighty God took on flesh and he walked this earth as fully human. And his humanity he understood suffering completely, and so he can sympathize with whatever you are going through. And he suffered to the point of death, which was the requirement necessary to pay the penalty for all sin for all time. And then after Jesus' sacrifice satisfied God's holiness, turning aside his wrath on sin, it says he came back to life. He has died and came to life again. Now, historians tell us that the city of Smyrna at one time was destroyed and then rebuilt. It was destroyed totally to ruins, and then uh, it was rebuilt. It was rebuilt into a, a beautiful uh, city with wide streets made of stones. It was, it was uh, rebuilt in such grandeur that the people at that time called it the city of life. And figuratively, it was the city of life because it had come back from the ruins. It had come back from the dead. It is now has life again. As a city in that region at that time, they had bragging rights of coming back from the ruins to a thriving city. Now, I believe Jesus is playing off of that and calling himself and speaking of himself as one who came back from the dead and is back to life again. I think he's saying, hey, you know, rebuilding a city, that's nothing. I came back from the dead. I can bring a person back to life forever. He's died and came to life again. That's significant. And he's the first and the last. Well, that's the description of Christ here in verse 8. Well, let's look at the dimensions of their suffering. Dimensions of their suffering is uh, kind of the second heading here. After Jesus introduces himself, he uh, identifies with their afflictions. Now, I want you to use your imagination this morning. I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine that as you came to worship this morning and being the creature of habit that you are, you sat in the same seat you sit in every single week, right? And as you're sitting there in, the, in, in those seats that you're always sitting in, you uh, look over across from you and, and there are three people, there's three seats there that are vacant. And you know the three people who occupied those three seats in the sanctuary every single Sunday. They're not there this week. And your mind kind of wanders and you wonder, you know, um, were they arrested perhaps for wearing the name Christian? Were they killed? And then you, then you look over to the other side of the room and, and you see that faithful saint who always sings with gusto every single Sunday. And he looks kind of tired this morning as you look over. And you, and you kind of even notice that the side of his face is all swollen. Was he, was he beaten? Because he simply claimed to be a follower of Christ. I mean, you know yourself, if you imagine this, that you're, you're, you risked your life to meet in this room to pray and sing and, and to hear the Holy Scriptures read. Imagine then the, the pastor makes his way to the front and he holds a little candle in his hands to give himself some light since all the other lights are off in the worship center. You don't want to draw attention to where you're meeting. You're hoping that the service isn't interrupted by some soldiers who discover you're holding worship services there to the Almighty God. 
Then you hear the, the pastor, the candle in his hand. He says in a, in a calm, soothing voice, he says, I, I have a letter, church in Smyrna, I have a letter that I would like to read to you this morning. And it was sent from the risen Lord himself. And you can just hear a pin drop as the entire group just hangs on every word. And the pastor reads this letter from the first to the last, the one who died and came to life again. And he says, he says, imagine this now. He says, I know your afflictions. I know your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are, and are not. And you're sitting there and you go, I just can't believe this. Jesus knows. A personal letter written to the place where I gather for worship. And it's written by Jesus. And it begins with, with, in the letter with the words, I know. I know. What does Jesus know? Well, it says here he knows their afflictions. He knows your afflictions. He knows you're a fully child of God. He knows what you're going through right now. Church, he knows your afflictions. Now, the word in verse 9 for afflictions, by the way, it means pressure. And not just any pressure, but intense pressure. Matter of fact, that word affliction, it was used to describe an execution in which someone would be forced to lie down on the ground and then they would place the heaviest rock they could find on this person and the weight of that rock would gradually crush the very life out of him and he would die. You know the feeling? I mean, perhaps for you it isn't that extreme, but what you're going through is as if a rock that weighs a ton is about to crush the life out of you. And you go, you kind of wonder, does anybody know? And you start to sing that old spiritual song, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Oh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Listen, he knows. He knows about the stress. The one who's the first and the last knows the situation from beginning to end. As a matter of fact, he sees the ending point, even though you can't see the ending point. The one who died and rose again, he knows every detail. And so when trouble hits, it really comes down to what are you going to trust? What are you going to trust? Are you going to trust your understanding of the situation or are you going to trust the one who can see the ending points? How are you responding to troubles and to hurt and to pressures and to problems that come into your life? Well, the church in Smyrna was under intense pressure, pressures of all kinds. And financial pressure was one of those. And that's why Jesus says, not only do I know your afflictions, I know your poverty. He knows your poverty. Now, the city of Smyrna called um, Izmir today, it's located in the Republic of uh, Turkey. But the city of Smyrna at that time, it was known for its beauty. It was the center of science and the center of medicine. And there was even a famous street there called the Street of Gold. It was also a very, very wealthy city. Very wealthy. But the believers in Smyrna were not sharing in this wealth. He, called, he says, I know your poverty. Why are they not sharing in this wealth? Well, it was also a leading center uh, for the cult of emperor worship and a worship of an eclectic mix of gods. And since their, 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 the citizens' social life revolved around pagan worship, anyone who refused to participate in this worship would be branded as rebels and even denounced as atheists. They were called atheists because they didn't believe in the emperor. They didn't believe in their gods. They called them atheists. And so you know what that meant. Christians would not even be hired to work in any of these businesses. Customers wouldn't buy their stuff. Some of their businesses would have been vandalized. I mean, it was hard to make a living if you chose not to worship the emperor. And Jesus comes and he says, I know your poverty. The word for poverty that's used here speaks to being absolutely destitute. Calmly describes beggars uh, who live not by their own labor and, and efforts, but by the gifts of others. And Jesus says, I know your poverty. I know your poverty. But notice the next thing here. He says, I know your poverty, yet... You are rich. You are rich. 
What does it mean to be rich? Well, I guess that depends on your definition of rich. I mean, is it really the one with the most toys? Or as Alan Alder said, it isn't necessary to be rich and famous to be happy. It's only necessary to be rich. What's your definition of rich? Joseph Stoll, he tells of a visiting one of his students at Moody who was from Belarus in the former Soviet Union. And he tells of visiting Belarus one time and he was driving down this long, twisted dirt path and at the end of the dirt road was this little shack with a little garden out to the side and a, and a dilapidated uh, tiny barn that was behind the, the garden. And Pastor Stoll writes this, he says, my wife and I pulled up our van and started to climb out. The student's mom came running out he said, I wish I had a picture of her. She had a, a babushka, this do-rag tied under her chin. She had a ruddy face, and she was just beaming with joy. And as I talked with her, Stoll says, all she could talk about was Jesus. And all she could talk about was she was bubbling over about what heaven was going to be like and, and how much she loved the Lord and what the Lord meant to her, and she just never stopped beaming with joy. And here's a woman who has just this little garden, uh, one little kitchen, one other room that's divided by a sheet on a rope to make a living room and a bedroom. And in her dilapidated barn, she has one pig which she raises all summer to eat all winter. That's her portfolio. That's it. It's all she has. Would we call her rich? That's one rich woman. See, we're a product of our Western thinking and American culture, so our definition of rich is skewed. Watch your definitions. What makes a church rich? What makes a church rich? A large and talented staff? A calendar that's full of activities? Is that what makes a church rich? Is it an attractive meeting place? Is that what makes a church rich? A church with plenty of parking? A big bank account? Is that what makes a church rich? Well, the believers in Smyrna had none of those. Watch your definitions. Jesus knows of their poverty, yet they are rich in his eyes. You know why? Because from this lesson here in the church in Smyrna, the best indicator of a church's health and wealth is the degree they are relying on Jesus for everything. Let me say it again. The best indicator of a church's health is the degree they are relying on Jesus for everything. If you don't have anything in this world, but you have Jesus, you are rich. If we have Jesus, we have enough. Now, you know what? I can say that very easily. That can come right out of my mouth pretty easily. Not a lot of effort there. Out it comes. Difficult to believe that and really live by that, honestly. Vance Havner put it this way. He said, it's not easy to preach on Smyrna nowadays. The average congregation has no mood to appreciate such a church. In a day of quick prosperity, it's not easy to interest a well-fed, well-clothed, well-housed Sunday morning crowd in the Smyrna brand of loyalty. Now get this. We are not interested in what it costs to be a Christian, but in what we get by being one. I don't know about you, but that's, that's incredibly convicting. How rich are you? How rich are you? What are you relying on? What have you been leaning on other than the Lord? And have you noticed when you start to do that, God starts to remove some of those props we're leaning on? Have you noticed that? He does. Have you had a misplaced trust? How has God been growing you lately to lean on Him more? Because the best indicator of a church's health is the degree they're relying on Jesus for everything. Well, I need to get to a third dimension to their suffering, not only afflictions and poverty. Middle of verse 9, Jesus says, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. You know, it's encouraging to hear that God knows your enemies. He knows your enemies. There are those who are slandering them. 
Do you know what it's like to be slandered? It hurts. Like the pastor who received those negative comments from that one man, as self-secure as he might have been, he is human, and words can hurt. They hurt. I mean, we can cite all we want the kid's catchy song, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. It's not true. Not true. Names do hurt us. More than if someone punched us in the face. Right now, it would take you only a matter of seconds to recall hurtful things said about you or to you. You'd have no problem going there right now. you come up with a list of stuff. For the church in Smyrna, the slander is coming from an unlikely source. It's coming from religious folks, the ones who profess to be Jews. Jesus says they really are not. But he says, look at the end of verse 9. He says they are a synagogue of Satan. And you go, well, that sounds a little harsh. Jesus isn't being anti-Semitic here. Apparently, at least some of the Jewish synagogues at that time were filled with hate for Christians. And Jesus puts his finger on the source of that hate. Who's the source of that hate? Satan himself. We see it again in the middle of verse 10. Jesus said, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. Who's behind all this? The devil. Satan. See, sandwiched between Jesus' two references to, to Satan is Jesus' directive to the church. A third heading, directive for continuing. How do they continue in their faith? What's the directive God gives here? Well, Jesus says in the opening words of verse 10, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Now, why does he talk about fear? Because what's the normal reaction to afflictions and suffering and troubles? Because when we're feeling crushed by the weight of the pressures and troubles in life, what usually is not too far behind? Fear. So Jesus says, do not be afraid. Now, at first pass, you might not find Jesus' words super encouraging. I mean, the do not be afraid, it's attached to his words here of what you are about to suffer. We would rather Jesus say, do not be afraid, your suffering is over. Do not be afraid, everything's going to be fine now. I mean, who wants to hear? Do not be afraid, more suffering to come. That's what Jesus says. He continues in verse 10 by saying, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now, I want to unpack a couple of things here and hopefully by the end, you're going to find some help for your own hurt. First thing I want us to note about that verse is uh, that we need to remember the source. We need to remember the source. The devil is behind this trouble. Now, I need to just kind of mention this Kind of quickly, but I need to go here just the same because there are many different reasons uh, that trouble can come into our lives. One reason is we can encounter problems simply because we live in a fallen world. In the Old Testament book of Job, it says, yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. <laughs> in other words, we face troubles in this world because this is in heaven. We aren't home yet. This world is fallen. We're going to have troubles in our lives. That's one reason. A second reason trouble and problems can come into our lives is because of unwise or sinful choices. These are self-inflicted troubles. I mean, if you choose to go against the laws of the land or even worse, you go against the moral laws put in place by God, then you may in fact face the consequences of that. And your problems today may be because of that. Okay, well, in the case of Smyrna, it's not self-inflicted that they brought on because of their sinful choice. Isn't trouble common merely to all because of living in a fallen world? No, Satan called the devil here is behind the suffering. They're suffering, they're trouble, they're being crushed because of one reason, their faithfulness to the Word of God. Their faithfulness to the Word of God. So remembering the one behind it can be helpful. Because if you're fearful of what Satan might do in your life, remember this. There's nothing, there is nothing that can't be turned for his glory and for your good. Remember the source. Second thing to note is found the words for 10 days. For 10 days. That's an interesting way to put it. Some see this as a literal 10 days. I kind of take it as a figure of speech referring to the time being limited and short. And so not only do we remember the source, we need to remember the Lord is still in control. The Lord is sovereign. 
The Lord is sovereign. He sets the timetable. God permits Satan to do this, but not beyond his limits. In other words, God says to Satan, you can do this much and no more. That's it. Stops here. Church, God is sovereign over the workings of the evil one. Everything must pass first through God's hands. Everything. Now, I know that opens up all kinds of questions as to why God would allow Satan to do anything at all in the first place. And why doesn't he just stop him altogether? I'm not going to get into all that. There are times that that Satan can't have his way at all in a person's life, and other times there's a limit to it. And I'm not going to get into all the ins and outs of that, but I just want to say this for our purposes this morning. All of it must pass through God's hands, all of it. And God allowing it here is for different reasons and the intentions of Satan. Satan intends this persecution suffering to cause their faith in God to unravel. He tends to harm the church with it. God allows this trouble into the believers' lives in Smyrna to test them, it says, to test you. Test in the sense of proving what is really in their hearts. And nothing proves the reality of our faith more than when pain invades our lives. Nothing proves the reality of our faith than when pain invades our lives. Now, why is it that when trouble comes in a person's life, it can turn a person to be stronger and, and they can be more faithful. And if, it, and if something similar of, of, of adversity went into another person's life, they become hard and, and bitter and they turn away from God. Why the difference? A daughter complained to her dad about how hard things were for her and she said, as soon as I solve one problem, another one comes up. I'm tired of struggling. Well, her dad, a chef, took her into the kitchen where he filled three pots with water and he placed each of these pots on high fire. And soon, each of these pots came to a boil. In one pot, he placed carrots. In the second pot, he placed eggs. And in the last boiling pot, he placed ground coffee beans. He let them sit and and boil a little bit longer without saying a word. Well, the daughter, of course, getting a little impatient with this, wondering, what in the world are you doing, Dad? Well, after a while, he went over and he turned off the burners. He took out the carrots and he placed them in a bowl and he pulled out the eggs out and he placed them in a bowl and then he poured the coffee into a bowl and he turned to to his daughter and he said, Honey, what do you see? She said, I see carrots, eggs, and coffee. Well, he brought her a little closer and asked her to feel the carrots and she did and, and noted they were soft. He then asked her to take an egg and break it, and so after pulling off the shell, she observed the hard-boiled egg. And finally, he asked her to sip the coffee, and she smiled as she tasted its rich flavor. And she asked, well, you know, okay, that's great, Dad, but what does it mean? Well, he explained that each of them had faced the same adversity, boiling water, but each reacted differently. The carrot went in strong, hard, and unrelenting, but after being subjected to the boiling water, it softened and became weak. The egg was fragile. Its thin outer shell had protected its liquid interior, but after sitting through the boiling water, its inside hardened. The ground coffee beans were unique, however. By being in the boiling water, they changed the water. He asked his daughter, when adversity knocks on your door, which are you? How are you responding to the pressures of life? Is it weakening you? Is it making your heart harder? Your heart harder for Him? You're turning away from God? Or is it producing the sweet aroma around you that everyone benefits from? It's interesting to note, by the way, that the name Smyrna uh, means myrrh, which was a fragrant spice. But in order to get the fragrance out, that spice had to first be crushed. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, but their fragrance of faithfulness came out when they were crushed. The fragrance of their testimony came out of the crushing pressure of their suffering. So when crushed, 
Let's be a church that oozes with the fragrance of faithfulness. In face of trouble, we're to be people, we're to be a church characterized by faithfulness, not fear. Now I want you to notice Jesus' final words to the church here, end of verse 10, end of verse 11. He says, be faithful even to the point of death and I'll give you the crown of life. Continues verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Now, the suffering church in Smyrna likely goes beyond what most of us in this room have, have, have ever faced and may ever face in our lifetime. But there are timeless lessons for us just the same. We have some help here in these final two verses for those who hurt. And so I want to leave you with two timeless principles from what I just read in these final two verses. Principle number one, principle number one is faithfulness now, reward later. Faithfulness now, reward later. He reminds them to be faithful. Now these aren't trite words. They're spoken by one who knows what you're going through, who can empathize with your suffering. Hebrews 4, 16 says, we, we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are yet without sin. And so he says to you, because he's gone through it himself, he can say, hang in there, hang in there. Don't bail. Be faithful to the end. You look at your life in front of you. I don't know what you're all going through, but you look at your life in front of you, and you might go, how in the world can I be faithful to the end? You know how? Be faithful today. Be faithful today. You say, well, that's too long. Okay. Just be faithful the next 60 minutes. Just for the next 60 minutes. Let me break it down some more. Be faithful for the next 60 seconds. All of us can do 60 seconds. And then when the next 60 seconds come, I'll be faithful to that. And then the next and then the next. So don't go way down the road. I'll be faithful to the end. No, be faithful in the moment that you're in for the next 60 seconds, the next 60 minutes, for the next day. And he says it comes with a promise. I'll give you the crown of life. Now, in the Olympic Games at that time, the winning athlete would receive a garland wreath that likely would be placed around their necks. As a matter of fact, I believe you could walk a, a, into a museum in that region today and you'd find a gold wreath housed there. Church, be faithful to the end. There's a winner's wreath waiting for you. You won't regret for a moment crashing through any of those quitting points that are in front of you right now. You won't regret it. There's something that, that awaits you that is far better than any suffering that you have to go through in this life. I believe it was Mother Teresa who said this, when we get to heaven, the worst suffering we will have endured on earth will seem like nothing worse than one night in a bad hotel. Now, I like that. I don't know. Sounds reasonable. Faithfulness now, reward later. It'll be far better than anything we're going through now. Well, I've got to give you a second timeless principle. So I heard one preacher put it, winners won't hurt forever. Winners won't hurt forever. You may feel the pain you're experiencing. It's just never going to end. You might be anxious about what's around the corner. You may feel like quitting, and you even have some justification for it right now going through your mind. I, got, I have reasons. I can do it. I can justify this. The hurt that's very real to you right now, Jesus is the first and the last, the one who died and came to life again. He's with you. He triumphed over death, and he can bring every person who trusts in him back to life forever. This hurt, the hurt that you're going through right now won't last forever. He says here that he who overcomes, get this, will not be hurt at all by the second death. Now, there's a reference here to the second death. Now, I want you to turn to the book of Revelation, and I kind of gave a Freudian slip in the first service. I said, when we come, when we come to Revelation chapter 20 in our study, yeah, there was a little Freudian slip there. Anyway, I want you to look at Revelation chapter 20. Just for a moment. It speaks of the second death. We've got to go here. Revelation 20, verse 12. 
And honestly, if, if I do continue to the end, and certainly leaning that way, we will get to this in, in greater depth. But it, we, I, have to, I have to address it here. Uh, verse 12, Revelation 20, verse 12. Uh, John says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. Now go down to verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, listen, there is, there is just no way I can sugarcoat this even if I wanted to. There's just no way. Every person in this room is touched by the first death. As someone quipped, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> You're going to be there. No one escapes that except, of course, you know, those still alive when Jesus returns. I understand that. But at that moment of truth, now get this, at that moment of truth and standing before God as described here in Revelation chapter 20, it's going to, in, in which you're going to be known that what you're trusting in for your salvation. That's what they're, he's, he's opening up here. What are you trusting in for your salvation? And it really boils down to one of two options. There are no others. One option is you're trusting in yourself in one way or, the, or another to save yourself. That's one way. Second way is you're trusting in Jesus Christ for your salvation. And Jesus Christ made the way, the, the, the only way. And so if you've never personally put your trust in the person of Jesus Christ, then it says here, you will be hurt by the second death. If your name is not written in the book of life, you are in danger of the second death. Now, because I love you, I really do, and I, and I would do a disservice if I didn't ask you this. Have you settled that? Have you settled it? If you haven't, grab me after the service. I'll, I'll drop whatever I'm doing and I'll talk with you. And if I can't, I'll hook you up with someone else who can. So I want you to settle that. I want you to settle that. Because if you have settled it, if you are trusting in the person and finished work of Christ on the cross, then even though you die the first death physically, you won't have to die the second death. It says here back in chapter 2, you will not be hurt by second death because winners won't hurt forever. And if your name is written in the book of life, you are a winner. Uses the word overcomer. Overcomer. But you know what else that means today where we live life? That if affliction that seems unbearable to you, you can overcome. That situation that threatens your loyalty to Christ, you can overcome. That feeling that you might have right now of quitting or, or that discouraging word that was spoken about you or, or that hurt you can't seem to shake off right now, you can overcome. You're called a winner here. You're called overcomers. So continue on. Continue on. Keep running the race. No matter what obstacles are thrown in your way, church, keep running the race. It will be worth it all. Keep running. Keep running. You say, ah, you don't understand my obstacles right now. Wilma Rudolph was the 20th of 22 children. She was born prematurely, and doctors did not expect Wilma to even survive. She did survive, and by the age of four, she contracted a double pneumonia and scarlet fever, leaving her left leg paralyzed. She learned to walk with the aid of a metal brace. When Wilma was nine years old, I mean, you talk about obstacles here. When she was nine years old, she finally said, I'm going to remove this leg brace. And I'm going to begin walking without it. And by 13, she developed a rhythmic walk. And that same year, she decided she was going to start running. And she said, I want to run in some races. And so she entered her first race, and she came in last. The next three years... Wilmer came in dead last in every single running race she entered. But you know what? She, she kept on running. She kept on running. And one day, true story, she won. 
Eventually, this little girl who was not supposed to live, obstacle number one, and then was not supposed to be able to walk, obstacle number two, would run and win three gold medals in Rome's 1960 Olympic Games. What obstacles are you being called right now to overcome? Because through Christ, you can overcome anything that's thrown in your way that's trying to stop you from running right now. There's no reason you have to, even though there's obstacles there. Keep on running. Keep on running.